Hey, what's going on, guys? Dom the Movie Nerd here, and have you heard the good word? Game of Thrones is back! Well, not really, but the first official spinoff, House of the Dragon, is set to premiere next year on HBO, and that got me thinking about how Game of Thrones, the number one most watched show for a decade, just seemingly disappeared from the culture after that god-awful finale. And I wanted to find out why, which is why I'm proud to present the newest hit show from the Talking TV network, Talking Thrones, the new weekly show where myself and friend of the channel, Professor Pat Huber, get together to break down each and every single episode of this hit show. We've got focus character segments, we break down the lore, we go over some old reviews, all to get to the question of where did this show go wrong? It's a really fun time. You guys are not going to want to miss this. So head over to the Talking TV channel on YouTube and Spotify to check it out. We go live every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Audio goes up the following Saturday. It's going to be a really great time as we once again battle it out for the throne. All right, people, hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. We're back to close off November right before we get into the last month of the year. That's right, 2021 is almost over. You could tell by my shadowy, ominous, loomy, gloomy lighting that we're clearly doing House of Gucci. I've got Adam Sober back (laughs) from, I don't really know where he's been, but he's been doing quite a lot recently. Adam, happy to have you back on the show, dude. Have you been? I've been great. Thank you for having me, man. I mean, this past year has been such... A, a roller coaster, show. a shit show, a roller coaster. A lot of things have happened since we graduated. Yeah. And the last time, last time I was on it was pre-pandemic. Was, yeah, it was literally like a month or two before we uh, before I moved up to uh, Liverpool. Syracuse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and because I went it was you and Brandon. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I moved up and then just the world just started to collapse. Well, was- um. But, you know, right now I'm I'm in a very uh, fortunate and uh, very lucky position. Um, That's good. Yeah, I well, just, we're, we're yeah. here to review House of Gucci today and uh, all of that and more. Stay cool. tuned. Oh, yeah. We've upgraded since the last time you it were here. It seems we got like it. Now. We got views <laughs> now. Yeah, that's how long it's been since Adam has been on the channel. He hasn't been brought up with all of the new changes. But people, like I said, we are reviewing Ridley Scott's second film that he's put out within 2021. The dude is 80 plus years old, and I still have no idea how he manages to do this, but he somehow has. We are here to review House of Gucci, which is the film that semi-chronicles the rise and fall of the Gucci empire, which is ironic considering the fact that it's one of the biggest factors fashion labels in the world, but it didn't quite happen until all of the family members had left the agency. This is a film that stars Adam Driver, Lady Gaga, Jared Leto in some sort of makeup job that makes him look like a stuffed pig, Jeremy Irons and Al Pacino. <laughs> it is one of the most oh, it is one of the most hyped up movies of the year, simply for the fact that it's not a Marvel superhero movie. It supposedly True. is getting slated for a bunch of Oscars. Adam, before we get this started, what is your previous relationship with Ridley Scott movies? How many Ridley Scott movies have you seen previously? Like, what are you a fan of his? Oh movie? man, I mean, I love Ridley Scott. I mean, Blade Runner for me was one of the the films that got me really into filmmaking in high school. Uh, I watched it in in my film class, and I just fell in love. Like, I developed. I mean, I, I've loved movies since I was really young, but that was one of those films that just changed the game. Not only for me, I mean, just in the genre of like being a, a neo-noir, um, you know, sci-fi, philosophical, like it did so many things. It, it touched on so many topics um, and it's still one of, I think, the greatest films made in cinema history. Yeah, definitely. Um, Yeah, Ridley Scott, the whole thing about him with me is that if Ridley Scott's doing an 
epic, like a historical epic or a sci-fi movie, mm-hmm. sign me up. Like, yeah. because it, 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 again, like you look at what are the biggest Ridley Scott movies that people come to know and like have really engraved themselves mm-hmm. with the staples of the pop culture, right? Alien, Blade mm-hmm. Runner, Gladiator. You know, you get a random one-off yeah. sometimes that like he'll do like a Thelman Louise and that usually can break through like a mm-hmm. Master Man, which I really like, American Gangster, which kind of flew under the radar back in the day. But underrated, underrated. Very, very yeah. underrated. But Ridley Scott is one of those really interesting filmmakers where so he was te- technically a part of the film Bratz generation in the 70s, but like George Miller, he didn't really break out until the very end of the decade, right? Because Alien mm-hmm. didn't come out until 79, and he only had one film before that, The Duelist. Yeah. Um, he's mm-hmm. always... I don't know. Like when, whenever you think of a Ridley Scott movie, you never think of it in the sense of like a Spielberg or a Tarantino movie in the sense of like he's an incredible filmmaker, but mm-hmm. you don't necessarily recognize him because of stylistic choices. Right. Like with Scorsese, mm-hmm. you always recognize the camera techniques and the, and, exactly. the, and the similar actors that he has and the tones that he goes with. Same thing mm-hmm. with Spielberg, same thing with Tarantino. But with Scott, you never necessarily- he likes to change up his style. He I, I really like that. I mean, I love being able to do lots of different stories because you should have a style, but you should also be able to speak to lots of different things as a director, as a filmmaker, as a, as a creator, you know, as a, as a creative. Um, so when it comes to Scott, I think uh, with his kind of style, he, he tailors it to every project he does. Um, I definitely liked House of Gucci more than All the Money in the World, although that was amazing how he pulled that off, especially with the scandal, uh, you know, with, with Christopher Plummer, who yeah. is amazing. And he he came in and learned his lines and replaced and did all those scenes in like, I don't I like, know, like three two days, months. three days. I think it was three days of filmmaking. And he, he was the only person recognized at the Oscars for that movie, which is wow. insane to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. When you when you think about Christopher Plummer, I mean his his impact. That's a sep- That's a whole separate episode we could do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean Ridley Scott is definitely super influential on me. Spielberg as well. I mean, I grew up. You know, one of the the things also was uh, Indiana Jones, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, masterpiece of a movie. Uh, when I went to Disney World and saw like the behind the scenes thing, I just fell in love. Um, so yeah, from a really young age, I've, I've had a passion for it. Um, so yeah, is there, is there anything? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the, yeah. Big, so the big, the big thing that really, um, that my, my whole thing with Ridley Scott is that he's an amazing filmmaker, but I don't necessarily know if he's one of those people who's adapted to modern day sensibilities and filmmaking to the best of his ability. So like, I, I guess mm-hmm. like if we can break down a little bit of the history, right? So Ridley Scott, the insane thing is that he's one of those directors who's had arguably like one of the most influential films of the decade for like mm-hmm. four straight decades in a row. That's yeah. not an easy feat. Alien for the seventies, Blade mm-hmm. Runner for the eighties, Thelma and Louise for the nineties, Gladiator for the two and Gladiator for the two thousands. Right. Yeah. He, the 2010s, I guess you can make an argument for The Martian, maybe, but it, it, it's very, like, again, incredibly right. influential and mm-hmm. just big enough in order to, like, get him a lot of, like, really good praise. But, like, the thing is that, like, then you get the smaller Ridley Scott movies, right? The ones that come, like, in between the big ones like and, like, the, the ones that, like, nobody's heard of, like, Somebody to Watch Over Me, White Squall, Black mm-hmm. Rain, G.I. Jane, like, these movies that nobody has heard of. <laughs> really, like, really oh just God. in the background, none of his, uh, none of his big, like, his Adam, big be name. honest, you've never heard of any of those movies that I just listed. Nope. Exactly. And I'm and I'm a Ridley Scott fan. So exactly. you said exactly. those and I was like, You're like what? Fuck? <laughs> yeah. I was like trying I was trying to see if I knew any of those because like I, I'm big on letterbox. I promise you, you haven't. But so yeah. something really weird happened in the 2010s, which is where mm-hmm. so in the late 2000s after American Gangster, Ridley Scott had a couple movies that came out that were not well received to say the least because Adam, a little bit of a trivia question. Do you know what movie he released immediately after American Gangster? Oh man. A little bit of trivia for you. I want to see if you get this. Oh, this is that's hard. Um after American Gangster, did he what did he do in between that and The Martian? A um, lot of movies, actually. It's it's kind of like insane. big like big ones. Oh yeah. Oh okay. yeah. Because I'm trying oh, to so you want to know what they are? 
Yeah. So in between American Gangster and The Martians, you got a eight year gap between them. American Gangster mm-hmm. 07, The Martians 2015. You got Body of Lies in 2008, starring Leo DiCaprio and Russell Crowe. Yes, famously, Leo DiCaprio mm-hmm. has collaborated with Ridley Scott. Then you get mm-hmm. the Russell Crowe Robin Hood in 2010. Mm-hmm. You get Prometheus in 2012. You get Saw The Counselor that. in 2013. And then you get Exodus Gods and Kings in 2014. And okay. all of those movies have got a rep with the exception of body of lies i'll say have got a reputation around them for not necessarily the best reasons robin hood was pretty critically reviled when it came Mm -hmm. out prometheus was very critically divisive but in recent years it's gotten more of a it's gotten more of like a cult following recently i think that's probably because the good grace that damon lindelof has earned in recent years Mm -hmm. the counselor is still one of the most baffling movies i've ever seen i haven't seen that one either if you want a movie that you just want to like are scratching your head at at both how this movie got made and just how it's functioning, just mm-hmm. watch that movie. And then Exodus Gods and Kings, which f- famously earned Ridley Scott uh, the, the phrase where he said, oh, yeah, I'm not going to cast Middle Eastern actors to play Middle Eastern characters because nobody will watch it because it's not in movie stars. Famously a uh, controversial quote, to yeah. say the least. So I that was really the moment where it started to show like necessarily his age as far as, OK, so he's not really making movies for uh, for for audiences really mm-hmm. anymore, especially recently since he's now added himself to the list of directors that have just mm-hmm. you know gone after superhero movies. So yeah, yeah. In, in order for like you know uh, social media hype, but so that's I mean that's also another subject about superhero movies and just I mean I'm a big superhero guy, you know that uh, having that honestly I think of superhero movies as like the new westerns yeah. because they're so popular. Like right. when are we gonna get sick of it? Like there were so many westerns made. In like the 19, I don't know, like 19, like 40s and and 50s and stuff. But I think superhero movies are honestly the new Western because they're making tons of money. They have, you know, they're getting all these big names in there. Um, Sorry, I'm getting I'm getting off on a tangent. No, but yeah, go with it. You get. Um, But I do think that there's merit uh, to these superhero movies. I think a lot of them are art. I don't I don't think they're the roller coaster ride that Scorsese described them as. I mean, I think a lot of them can speak to political issues. A lot of them speak to social issues, um, you know, world world problems. You know, people resonate and uh, I think really appreciate all these different characters that they can relate to in a very real way. My, my um, whole thing with the whole superhero thing as far as that goes and, and like with with scott's contribution to it is i'm not necessarily going to like say that any of the directors are necessarily wrong or right for having their opinion they just have their opinions on them my whole thing is i'm just mad at the media machine constantly baiting them into these types of responses because that's literally all they do they just bait them into these types of responses so they can get the twitter crowd angry and flustered yeah you know because that's that's kind of what it comes down to my yeah. whole thing is i like superhero movies i don't necessarily enjoy all of them the way that i used to i'm not necessarily like craving every new bit of superhero content mm-hmm. i do definitely think and I think this also has to do with the fact that we are living in the social media machine, which is why it feels so much more Mm -hmm. apparent than say when the Westerns came out is that it is that because we are inundated with so many of them for a year, it's not that they're bad movies, but they've kind Mm -hmm. of lost a little bit of their luster in the sense Mm -hmm. that in the sense that like, how different can you really make them when there are so many, so many being made? Yeah. You know, they do. A lot of them do start to feel a little cookie cutter, but I think that's honestly just a problem with the, the basic three act or eight sequence structure that most movies have. So, you know, you got when, when it comes to superhero movies, you know, it's all the same, just with different characters and different things happening. And then at the end, there's a huge fight. You know, it's, it's kind of, um, it's formulaic. So Marvel. <laughs> yeah. I mean DC tries to be different, yeah. which I appreciate. I'm very excited for the Batman. Um yeah. with you know DC's black label. Uh they're doing lots of really cool stuff. But DC I'm not a huge fan of the movies. I think some of them have done really well. Um, you know, like I think Snyder, the trilogy, there are some positives, some negatives, you know. First and foremost, I'm a DC fan, so I'm always going to have that little bit of bias behind did you see me. That, uh, did you see that Snyder's doing a, um, he's wrapping up his uh, Justice League arc in comic book form? Really? Yeah, go, go ahead and look it up. He was up. very, but he, again, like I saw yesterday, he posted something on Twitter, like the social media, yeah. he's already getting the Twitter crowd stirred again. He posted like a pick of Thanksgiving time, <laughs> then he posted like a comic book pic of like, of like, the, you know, his version of Dark Side. And yeah. I'm like, oh boy, here we go again. 
here we go again. We, we got friggin' five years of this <laughs> that finally culminated in the Snyder Cut. We're doing it again. But yeah. I, I guess if anything to bring it back to Ridley Scott, the point being is that Ridley Scott in recent years has not necessarily had the best track record where he's almost a mm-hmm. little bit become like a little bit of a Steven Soderbergh where he's mm-hmm. pumping out all these films. He put he, again, this is the second year in in four years that he's put out mm-hmm. two movies right? because he famously put out Alien Covenant and All the Money in the World in 2017 and yeah. now he put out The Last Duel and House of Gucci this year but I don't necessarily know if he's making movies anymore to really say something. It feels mm-hmm. like he's just making movies for the sake of making movies. That reflected mm-hmm. I think in The Last Duel where you have a movie that I'm sorry, Matt Damon and Ben mm-hmm. Affleck as medieval characters Get the fuck out of here. Like, that's first and foremost rule number one, besides the fact that the makeup looks horrendous in that movie. And the yeah. fact that, okay, that they have the gall to say that that movie's like Rashomon when mm-hmm. they don't even clearly understand like how Rashomon actually works structure wise. Okay. <laughs> And now you have this movie, which, if I can get into a little bit of my spoiler-free thoughts, functions somewhat like this strange mix between a Scorsese biopic, mm-hmm. a weird film at film version of Succession, mm-hmm. and an SNL stage play, I guess. It's probably, <laughs> like, the nicest that I could give it. Where I, I saw the movie yesterday with my grandma, and throughout the first half of the movie, I'm constantly scratching my head and wondering, I'm like, is this a comedy? Like, what the hell is this movie trying to accomplish? Like, you have yeah. Lady Gaga in the, in Lady Gaga and Adam Driver in these ridiculous-looking mm-hmm. costumes doing these ridiculous accents. Like, everything is so puffed up. Everything is so ham. Everything is so over the top. But, like, it's intriguing, to say the least. Mm-hmm. Like, the story itself, in and of itself, is fascinating because yeah. we're kind of seeing this flux of stories where – about, you know, just because of like social media and because like certain things that are like were previously mm-hmm. inaccessible are now so accessible, you know, you're kind of getting into like these, you know, the, these massive like kind of, you know, sprawling families and kind of getting like essentially like the new version of the crime epic, but in the form of like these strange like family, like, um, but what's the word I'm looking for for the God for like, like family, um, like try dynamic. To exactly. Yeah. You know, um, story. So I don't know. I guess. Brass tacks, immediate first thoughts after watching the movie. Because like I kind of coaxed you into it because you were kind of like, oh, we should do Ghostbusters, we should do this, we should do this. And I'm like, nah, we 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 gotta do this. After I watched okay. that, I'm like, I need I'm, to I'm talk glad about I, this I, movie. I'm glad I watched it. Um I have it's still fresh in my mind, so I have lots of uh conflicting. <laughs> I mean, I I I read the article. <laughs> oh I read, yeah. I read the article. Um, I think I'm very much on the same uh same page with you yeah but not for nothing i think it does a good like i get what you're saying about the scorsese biopic thing um it felt almost like i don't want to say wolf of wall street because wolf of wall street is amazing um but it did you know it for the um the only thing that really reminded me of it and paralleled there was him you know, becoming greedy and not caring for his wife and then having the affair and, you know, that kind of bringing in, you know, drama, you know, but uh, I think overall it tried to do a lot of things. It, you know, it, like, like reading the article, I was also, yeah, like I laughed, you know, uh, yeah. I, to, re- I to reference what times. Adam's to reference what Adam's talking about, I sent him an of an entertainment we uh an entertainment weekly magazine uh, article that mm-hmm. I watched last night, which is a breakdown where they interviewed Tom Ford, the film director and fashion designer who famously is in this movie. Not that you would know it because it, if if you don't recognize the name, you'll blink or you'll miss it. Oh, Tom Ford famously worked with the character some of the characters in this movie, some of the Gucci that you see in this movie, mm-hmm. and famously helped to bring you to what it is. And he was interviewed, and some of the so the quotes that he said, and this is still one of my favorite quotes i think i've ever seen for an immediate film reaction afterwards where his exact quote is the film is dot 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 well i'm still not quite sure what it is exactly but somehow i felt as though i'd lived through a hurricane when i left the theater was it a force <laughs> or a gripping tale of greed i often laughed out loud but was i supposed to and i don't think i've ever agreed with an immediate take on a film from somebody within the industry as hard as i have with this one like it's kind of insane how yeah. it captured my exact thoughts after the fact yeah i mean tom ford is a ma- he's only done what two, two things films. Or, two, two films, films. single man and, and nocturnal animals i've only seen nocturnal animals i need to see a single man tom ford he has such a great sense of story and character i mean obviously wardrobe duh clearly um but yeah i mean i i agree i think there were times like this is a spoiler so yes. um i felt the sex scene 
well, uh, you know, uh, was a little too long. I was laughing a little, hard at that. I was, was literally, yeah. I, I was literally <laughs> like, I, I don't even know what this is supposed to be. Yeah, it was like I was like, oh, this is going on a little long. <laughs> like, like it was, um, you know, it it, it was, uh, I was, you know, and then it cuts to the um the wedding. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm still just I'm I'm laughing thinking about it. There was a line by Jared Leto where he's like, "You a sack of potatoes." <laughs> I was like, I, I I don't a lot of it a lot of it was really funny. Uh, I think, right, but that's the problem. Is was it supposed to be like I I have to imagine where I'm like I, I would it went it's, back and it's, forth. Yeah, this is one of the first instances in a long time in a long long time where I would have just loved to have been on the set during the day it just to see like what the direction was and like just yeah. figure out where the motivation was coming from. Cause like for the life of me, I have no idea what Ridley Scott was trying to do with this movie. Like this is famously like Ridley Scott's mm-hmm. had a couple of these where this is a project that he had had lingering in development hell mm-hmm. since the early two thousands. And I don't necessarily know how he made it a decade or two decades ago. It would have mm-hmm. made that much of a difference, but just considering the fact that the, the film plays out as like part farce, part mm-hmm. tragic tale of greed like i don't know like yeah. did this almost feel like an adam mckay parody at times but without the self-awareness honestly a little bit but i i mean you could chalk that up to maybe the editing maybe the editor sure. Sure. saw something i mean obviously Ridley scott oversaw it um but maybe that was the best that they got for those scenes and he felt you know, I mean, sometimes when you're watching things, you think, oh, this will work. This will be funny. Each, I, I think he did a good job balancing, um, trying to balance the tone. I mean, at the end, it gets, you know, you see him get shot and killed. Right. Um, but there are so many different moments in the movie. I mean, how can you put someone's life into, you know, two and a half hours? Right. And then, of so course, I think he, I think. I think right. I think not for nothing. He tried to do a lot because it is so much to try right. and encompass a person with so much, uh, you know, emotional depth. I did think there were things that didn't work, but I don't think I don't think that that didn't uh, that that ruined the whole movie for me. I still yeah. enjoyed it. Um, you know, obviously, the the costumes were great. The set design was amazing. Uh, I didn't think the accents were that bad. I did think Jared Leto looked like he was in some kind of rubber, <laughs> <laughs> like face mask, rubber suit. <laughs> like, um, I still remember, dude, I don't know if I, if, I, if I said this to you. I still remember when the first poster that had like the whole cast lined up, you know, it's like getting ready for like, you know, the Oscar promotional campaign. And I just saw Jared Leto and I'm like, what the fuck? Fuck. Like, what are you doing, man? Come Jared, on. Leto, Jared Leto pops into everything. Jared, Jared Leto is just like the king of online trolling at this point. And I'm like, look, it, it, I mean, he's a good he's a people, good actor. I don't yeah. I think I mean, people hate on him a lot, but I think he's a good actor. I think, um, you know, he's it, very, very talented. It, uh, it just felt it felt very hokey and campy. Yeah, like, it's, like, it's in the like these. I wish that, I wish that Chris was here because Ridley Scott's one of Chris's favorite filmmakers. And whenever Jared Leto comes up in conversation, he actually like has a lot of insight. But like just to break it down for people like what this movie is about, because I just realized we've been talking about this movie mm-hmm. the entire time. And like there may be people who like don't actually know what this movie is about. So this movie is actually based on the book that was written in 2001, The House of Gucci, a sensational story of murder, madness, mm-hmm. glamour, and greed by Sarah Gay Forden, right? That famously follows events that occurred between the late 70s and the early 90s in which the heir to the Gucci empire, Maurizio Gucci, played in the film by Adam Driver. He's the mm-hmm. son of Rudolfo Gucci, um, portrayed by Jeremy Irons, ends up falling for Patrizia Reggiani, mm-hmm. who in the film is the daughter of a truck driver who ends up worming her way into the Gucci empire and starts to uh, tear it down from within, obviously mm-hmm. bringing her into conflict with the other controlling interest in the company, that being Al Pacino's Aldo Gucci and his son, Jared Leto, as uh, Paolo Gucci. And mm-hmm. so the, the film... I guess if I can break it down. So like as far as like the start of like some of my problems with it and and like kind of why I bring up the comparison Mm -hmm. to um, Martin Scorsese is that the thing about it is that whenever you watch a Scorsese biopic, like there is just something about the way that Scorsese does a biopic. 
Mm -hmm. that really differentiates it from like most run-of-the-mill biopics, right? It's weird because biopics have been in this really weird spot for the last couple of years ever because the problem is Bohemian Rhapsody really kind of like started to screw them over as far as like breaking down the lines of like, oh, what's real versus what's fictitious? Is this actually like, trying to be an ode to the real person or mm -hmm. is this trying to like just create more sensationalism, you know, popcorn fun for entertaining people because they, mm -hmm. we both know like kind of what a crapshoot Bohemian Rhapsody was, but there are still a lot of people who love yeah. that movie and that movie made a lot of money. Do I think this movie's gonna have the same impact no because no. i don't know how many people are gonna relate to like the gucci label the same way that yeah they would do Freddie well Mercury. it's a huge it's a huge name i think people are interested in uh in the gucci name i don't know i mean obviously freddie mercury is a whole different thing i was surprised that um uh, man who was it uh Remy malik uh, with, or yeah um I, no i wasn't surprised that he won like it made sense out of the lineup of that year, I think. I don't remember the other nominees. Um, there, there were only two that should have been there. Uh, put it that way. <laughs> Wait, who was? Who, so it who was else? it was Bale for Vice and Bradley Cooper for Star Is Born, and right, those are the right. only two that should have been nominated to begin I with. I think. I think. Uh, I think Bale should have taken it for Vice. I mean, he was great as Dick Cheney. Yeah. You know, he the voice, the 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 weight he put on, the cadence of. I mean, really everything. But back to Bohemian Rhapsody, I think um that was different it won a lot of oscars uh the sound was great because you can't tell whose voice you don't know if it's rami you don't know if it's a mixture of freddie's vocals right. you don't know if it's adam levine i think came on and did something um and then there was rocket man oh, which he did with he did. you know he did something all right in that movie <laughs> I'm surprised Taron Egerton didn't get nominated for Rocket Man. I am not because I think that enough people were still burned out from it. And also, uh, mm -hmm. Bohemian Rhapsody opened up later. Uh, the, it's the release date. Bohemian Rhapsody opened up in October. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what's it called? Um, uh, Rocket Man opened in May. So, uh -huh. yeah. So th there was a big disparity mm -hmm. there just as far as the release dates. But I, I guess kind of like my whole thing with this is – it, it, as, as far as the whole House of Gucci argument is, mm -hmm. it feels like it's trying to be like this epic sprawling tale, yeah. of like crime and intrigue, right? But it, it feels like after like the first hour of the movie, it feels like every other scene, there's a scene missing, right? Where you have a mm -hmm. movie that is two and a half hours long and, it fe and, and it's very mm -hmm. strange because this is this very similar to another film that I saw earlier this year, obviously the many states of Newark, right? The Sopranos mm -hmm. prequel movie that dropped on HBO max, where it feels like a longer cut was mm -hmm. desperately needed. And we both know that like, this is well known. Ridley Scott is mm -hmm. well known for his director's cuts. Famously just look no further than kingdom of heaven with yeah. the three hour long director's cut of that, which might be one of the best epic uh, historical epic films ever made. Like that mm -hmm. truly does feel like a modern day Lawrence of Arabia, but that I feel like is problem number one because that kind of contributes to like some of the plot antics and plot semantics of it because mm -hmm. I feel like at a certain point it's like that the film will just be jumping around to like random things and character motivations start to not make sense at a certain point it feels like there are certain things that are missing that it feels like there should be included and mm -hmm. I definitely think that the biggest thing that doesn't help is the fact that because the film is so weighed down in its tone I mm -hmm. don't necessarily think that that makes for the most compelling of characters because just for my money at least the minute that each and every one of these characters are introduced i got them figured out like immediately and i know exactly mm -hmm. where they're gonna go i know that I, you can just tell like i know that gaga is gonna like cause the unraveling and is gonna try mm -hmm. and warm her way up and i know that pacino is gonna be the kindly old man who gets screwed over and at that point mm -hmm. i'm just kind of waiting for him to have the explosive pacino moment that we all know is coming you know <laughs> yeah and, i mean and, i think i mean pacino's great in everything he does i mean he yeah, was of course i think he was a highlight of this movie i mean he wasn't in it much but i think he was a highlight um the makeup job they did on Jeremy Irons was good, uh, which I didn't think his accent was. Yeah, I was about awful. to say, I'll bring up one thing. I'm like, so wait, all everyone is, of course, going after Jared Leto because he just makes himself a target. But nobody's going to talk about how awful Jeremy Irons, whatever yeah. the fuck accent that was. Yeah. Is. Um, yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> I think Jeremy Irons uh, was also, you know, he wasn't in it much, um, but he, you know, he he does make. Uh, an impact as a character like um i do agree with with ford on that uh but when it comes to the other characters i don't think adam driver was phoning it in um i think he gives a good natural performance um you know like there were a few scenes that were really nice and and really um 
you know, like heartwarming, you know, like him, you know, with the baby and, you know, then you see, but that's like before any of the, the drama, um, him and, you know, when he's, when they get married and all that, uh, but yeah, Lady Gaga, I think was good. I think she carried a lot. I think she carried a lot of the weight, not that they're not both amazing, amazing a actors. Um, but I just felt, I don't know what it was. I just think maybe with Adam driver, we could have seen a little, I wanted to see more. I wanted to see the the same emotional range that he had in um, like Marriage Story. Uh, obviously, different different story, different films, different character. But um, I would have liked to see a little. I mean, there's one scene that was like frightening with you know when he puts his hands around her and put, throws her up against the the door or the wall. Right. Um, and you know, it's also very different from Annette, which was right. He, I think, he gave his best per one of his best performances in that film uh that movie movie of the one of the top movies of the year for me um at least but i would have liked to see a little bit more with uh with that character i again i do think lady gaga did a, a really good job yeah lady gaga for me was definitely one of the highlights but i'm i'm mm -hmm. with you as far as driver like for me the biggest thing that i see with driver in this movie is kind of the through line to like obvi obviously like kind of mm -hmm. when he starts to realize that Gaga is screwing with him and just screwing with everything he knows and then he finally divorces her mm -hmm. and you're like okay thank god like you're just waiting but then all of a sudden okay now he's a now he's an evil businessman like there there mm -hmm. felt like there was something missing yeah you know? we didn't see we didn't see the um we didn't see the evolution or or de evolution of the character to the point where we believe that he's a bastard right we're supposed to because by the end of it you're like wow what a sicko like what a you know and then right. we didn't see we didn't see anything in we felt like the middle was missing of him going you know like we see all the money and stuff and behind the scenes uh but we don't really get um like a turning point moment uh or maybe we do and i just didn't catch it but we don't really get like a turning point moment where we're like wow or, or maybe this, that turning point was him with the affair and the um uh what was it oh yeah the, you mean the affair that literally comes out of nowhere he just they just run to switzerland and then he's like oh yeah this is my super old friend that i'm clearly gonna cheat on you with yeah yeah i mean maybe that was his um i'm i'm a douchebag moment now um but yeah i mean it felt it felt like something something was kind of was missing to see that character become someone you know completely different yeah, it's it's one of those instances where and I'm glad that you're helping because this mm -hmm. is kind of like helping to contextualize a lot of the problems that they have, because I, I do like as problematic and as kind of jumpy and all over the place as the tone is. I do like the first hour of the movie. I do think that like the build up, them meeting, it's it's a little bit traditionalist biopic. I feel like it could have been done a little bit more, but it does feel that's the most interesting part of the movie being introduced to this world, being introduced to this empire, like kind of what it means. But you're right, because around the middle half, it starts to feel like a whole lot of moments that are just happening and kind of like the juicy behind the scenes character moments aren't there, right? And a lot of it feels like it was cut for time just in order to like make, because again, Ridley Scott's like one of the only filmmakers that can get like a two and a half hour runtime and this is an Oscar bait film. So obviously the producers are going to let this be a little bit on the longer side because, you know, Oscar films, especially more recently, have tended to be a little bit on the longer side mm -hmm. unless they're A24. But the biggest thing for me is because it's seemingly like missing that natural mm -hmm. through line, it makes it almost feel just like a series of vignettes that are tied together rather than an actual full, complete vision of a film. And I guess this is the part where I wanted to jump in and have the streaming discussion because this is mm -hmm. really a thing that is, I'm starting to see impact a lot of the films that are coming out now, which is, and I've had this discussion, right? Because again, it's very, very similar to the discussion that I had around Many Saints of Newark, which is where I'm like, okay, it seems to me that with all these films that are coming out now, it's either longer cut or miniseries. And mm -hmm. they are constantly in this mode now where, and you especially see this from these directors, where these directors are so against the idea of kind of everything becoming streaming and everything becoming television and everything becoming content, mm -hmm. quote unquote, and they have to preserve the theatrical experience. But the problem is the films are most of the time not good enough to justify it. Like, so, like I'm sorry, and, mm. and I know I gave Denny Villa new flack about this a couple of weeks ago, but but we know the HBO Max thing was not his fault. But Dune 
to me, mm-hmm. the HBO Max thing, weirdly enough, helped, but Dune to me was the first truly cinematic film that I've seen in a while. Probably mm-hmm. since Tenet. I know, you know, we we all we've all had the Tenet discussion <laughs> yeah. up at this point. That's been done to death. But like be honest, Adam, how many films now? Like, obviously, you know, we hear directors talking and crying, mm-hmm. complaining about the preserving the theatrical experience, but even even the greats, like Spielberg with his West Side Story movie, like, I'm sorry, that mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily look like it's worth watching in a theater to me, you know? So, like, mm-hmm. I guess just my question is, is, like, mm-hmm. d- is, is there, like, a more proper version as to, like, how to watch this? Like, does this deserve the mini? Especially because, again, like, you mm-hmm. have the of so many examples of a story like this working much better in a mm-hmm. long form televised form rather than in a theatrical form. Like you have yeah. succession, you have billions, you have all these different shows that focus on these types of like corporate machinations, mm-hmm. like kind of like the corporate intrigue and drama yeah. like, it really does suit itself more so for dramatic long form television. So I almost can't help mm-hmm. but feeling in this instance that this would have been more interesting as a mini series, but I don't know. What's your take on that? Wow. I mean, uh, now that you bring that up, uh, it reminds me of uh, they did a mini series about uh, Versace. There you go. Uh, the, uh, the second in the American crime story. Yeah. I mean, what was, was that on FX or something? Yeah, FX. Yep. Because it was a yeah. follow up to people for SoJ. I mean, I think that would have been cool if they did this as a like, you know, a little mini, you know, one season thing to get everything in. But, you know, maybe really Scott didn't want to do that. I don't think he at his age, he's not someone who's trying to get on the small screen or right you know with his with his name that he you know he wants people in the theater he wants people to see it on the big screen um which is understandable i think when it comes to streaming uh you know it it's it's both good and bad because or at least for movies uh for tv it's great for movies, it is taking away from the big screen experience, the sound, the, you know, when you go into a theater, it's a different experience. It's it's a much more uh, intimate way to kind of escape into the story. Um, so I think when it comes to, you know, just the story of, of, of Gucci overall, I don't know if it has the draw um, to bring people to theaters right. like other movies do. Um, I think there are plenty of movies that are getting people back to theaters because they were so damaged last year by Corona and people being afraid. And, um, you know, like I, myself, I mean, I'm a huge movie movie goer and I didn't, I wasn't able to go for a long time. Um, you know, I went after I got vaccinated. Um, and you know, that's, you know, it was, it was a, a weird, uh, weird thing to watch movies on my TV or my, my computer, um, just cause it wasn't the same. I mean, I, you know, you experience it differently when you sit in the theater. Right. I, I think that's an interesting point because the thing that I've noticed a lot is I was absolutely convinced that mm-hmm. theaters were gone during the pandemic. I'm like, there's no way they can come back. There's mm-hmm. no way that financially they can make a comeback from this, obviously just with everything that happened during COVID. And mm-hmm. then I was obviously shocked once things started to opening and just how excited people were to get out. Right. But that obviously had to do with, you know, being trapped in their houses and not being able to go anywhere for a year. But now that mm-hmm. we've had like a couple months, we've had roughly like six to seven months now, people going back to movies. And now yep. that we've effectively like gotten out of like the summer blockbuster phase of world in a little bit of an Oscar season right now. Right. Mm-hmm. You have movies like, you have movies like King Richard and Belfast and movies like mm-hmm. that that are coming out that are starting to like spruce things up a bit, get ready for the Oscar race. But mm-hmm. a thing that I've noticed recently is that, and this was kind of just really starting to happen before the pandemic, mm-hmm. but this is a thing that I feel like has been sped up as a result of it, which is that obviously the only movies that are really making money mm-hmm. at the theaters are the spectacle fair, right? You know, obviously the Marvel movies, the horror movies, you know, the mm-hmm. free guys of the world, really any action movie, right? The ironic thing also being that action movies can do just as well on Netflix because the mm-hmm. ironic thing is that you had a Ryan Reynolds action comedy that opened in theaters in which, August. And which then- one? Free, free guy. guy free. Oh, I thought you were talking about Red Notice. Well, and then you had a Ryan Reynolds, Dwayne Johnson, Gal Gadot yeah. action movie that went straight to Netflix, Red Notice. So like that, yeah. the action movie's in a little bit of a weird spot right now where that one mm-hmm. really is interchangeable. But I, I, I think what's really fascinating about this is seeing how many of like the mid-level budget films Mm-hmm. can survive in theaters that's going to be like what's really interesting going forward because famously king richard mm-hmm. which was the most recent will smith oscar bait film that also opened on hbo max second to last hbo max drop of the year by the way before the matrix mm-hmm. um and that one flopped 
heavily. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole HBO Max simultaneous drop has been really interesting. Mm-hmm. But I, I guess the whole interest of this film, as mm-hmm. far as seeing its box office, appeal is, that is sorry, I don't want to cut you off. Yeah, yeah go that ahead, is though. interesting though because HBO Max. Um, I think it has brought a lot of people to uh, to pay for for that as a streaming service so they can make, you know, uh, pretty much any content they want to make. It's giving the um, the people that are making the shows and movies. I think it's giving the, I think it's giving them more freedom because now the money is coming directly from uh, from the audience. Right. And they're like, you know, when you're paying for Disney Plus, you're like, I want to see book of boba i want to see more mandalorian so it is kind of you know like people are giving their money to um you know to things that they want to see and it's just everything is on demand everyone wants certain things and i think right the, it's a much easier is, way to appeal to the consumer market rather than yeah. kind of, you know, provide. And so I think that's also I'm really mm-hmm. have to touch on that because I think that's another of the big reasons why you're seeing streaming mm-hmm. more than anything else, you know, kind of consume the theatrical demand. Because mm-hmm. the whole thing with the theatrical experience is that it is a little bit of a give and a take. You know, you are giving up your time. You are giving up mm-hmm. your hard earned dollars. But the payoff is that you could get an experience of like anything other versus the mm-hmm. at home consumer based experience. You watch what you want to watch when you want to watch at your own leisure. Right. So yeah. that of course is the kind of the push pull back and forth of streaming but the interesting mm-hmm. thing is and this is kind of like my last point that i think is this is the thing that i think that not a lot of filmmakers and just people in hollywood are really seeing which is that mm-hmm. the not necessarily people our age right or people like us who like we've been brought up on movies we love going to the movies our entire life and existence has been around the traditional movie going experience but if you mm-hmm. talk and look at like average like consumers like they people just don't in general like watching movies per se you know like like the whole thing mm. the whole reason why you've been seeing the whole like movies need to be spectacle movies need to mm-hmm. be events movies need to be like they need to have that extra edge you know i think that's a big reason yeah. why you're seeing you're gonna start to see video game movies make a big they're, yeah. gonna, they're, they're gonna get a big push forward is because resident yeah. evil I, I just watched the new resident evil movie recently resident evil raccoon city and that was mm-hmm. a movie that i went having no expectations for i'm not mm-hmm. a video game guy i've never played it the only thing i know about the resident evil is the mila Djokovic, yeah. Paul w.s anderson however many freaking of those movies that they made and mm. the thing that shot the hell out of me about raccoon city is mostly just that it was a competently made film mm-hmm. and that of course the people who showed up for it are going to be the diehard video yeah. game heads and so i think that right now is going to be a market because that mm-hmm. i mean the gaming audience just general i mean you've played video games so you can tell me better than more like the gaming audience mm-hmm. that's like that, that's yeah. like the superhero audience on steroids, you know, like you're going to, I like, think like yeah. what, what, what filmmaking has become now is it is. And I've been talking about this for a couple of years right now, right? The transition of these niches into the mainstream, right? You saw it with superhero mm-hmm. and nerd culture, right? That's good. Now you're going to start to see it with more of like video game IP stuff like that. That's mm-hmm. kind of the next step. Right. And so I guess that, more than anything else is what's scaring these filmmakers is because these filmmakers, a lot of them, you know, especially the older ones, they came up in a time Mm -hmm. where filmmaking essentially was really the only media. And so they could effectively Mm -hmm. tell these really interesting and engaging stories about reality. And now you're having these filmmakers try to tell these stories in a Mm -hmm. decade and an era where everybody just wants to tune out from reality. You know, reality is just so overbearing, so overwhelming, really now more so than anything else because of the constant social media push, because of the constant Mm -hmm. big tech push, constant 24 hour news cycle, everything getting pushed in your face. You're just, your neuron receptors can't handle it. And so that's why it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Exactly. That's why you're starting to see more of a Mm -hmm. push into like kind of these new arenas of escapism that to Mm -hmm. me is why superheroes are having such a success story right now i I think they're making a little bit of a mistake by constantly trying to push real world politics into Mm -hmm. superhero films and just pop culture entertainment in general but that is Mm -hmm. for me at least why kind of the argument appeals towards those types of filmmakers but how that affects something like house of gucci like i think Mm -hmm. at the end of the day ultimately i'm kind of surprised that this hasn't already found like a major thing with like the meme audience right because i mean you see a movie like this this is like Mm -hmm. a ripe target for the meme makers you know like (laughs) again i mean again it's like opening night like you'll see like the first 50 million memes pop Mm -hmm. up you know like what what superhero movie do you know now forget that what superhero trailer can you see now that doesn't already have like 15 million memes pop up like i'm i'm yeah, still spider man i mean spider man exactly i'm still Hold seeing on. new spider man uh, yeah i'm still seeing uh new spider man memes uh pop up all mm-hmm. over the place but um my big thing is um 
and again, like I, I guess kind of the source of dissatisfaction that comes for me is that while the movie in and of itself is kind of um, interesting, but not necessarily for the right reasons, my whole thing that I'm worried about is as these filmmakers continue to make movies consistently for themselves, it seems, they're, you're going to see this growing divide between them mm-hmm. and audiences. Like Spielberg is making West Side Story. Mm-hmm. Again, it's like, guy... Yeah, you just go and watch the original. Like, I, I really don't know what this is going to contribute ultimately. And like Scorsese kind of yeah. lucked out because Scorsese, um, Scorsese kind of hooked himself onto the streaming train that usually mm-hmm. bodes pretty well for auteur filmmakers, right? He made The Irishman for Netflix. He's making Killers of the Flower Moon for Apple mm-hmm. TV. Apple TV is also bankrolling his next film about which is gonna uh, which is gonna start Jonah Hill as Jerry Garcia, the Grateful Dead band member um they also obviously are bankrolling uh the joel cohen solo mm-hmm. cohen uh tragedy of Macbeth adaptation with denzel that which looks, looks great yeah unbelievable so like the yeah. streamers are really going to be the places to look forward mm-hmm. to look going forward obviously for a long form filmmaking so i guess that's why i guess um mm-hmm. scott's apprehension towards streaming if there is any right there's no obvious proof of it i guess it's mm-hmm. a little bit confusing to me because pretty much all of his peers are going towards streaming. Spielberg's next film is going I mean, to Netflix. I think he's trying to uh, preserve the art and and the experience of going to the theater. I mean, Spielberg, even a few years ago, was against Netflix films even getting, right. uh, you know, being nominated those, unless they were those in. Those dollars, unless, though, unless when, they were Netflix in, is, when Netflix is the only one to bet, when, when Netflix but, is the only but one. they have their theaters now, so that's the big true, difference. True, but, that, like, but that's, that's only for Oscar. That's only so yeah. they can get around the whole Oscars hating them thing. Let's be let's be real here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because let's you, face you it, said something. You said Netflix something the, earlier. Yeah, you said something earlier that was interesting about um, escapism and how uh, you know with how much media there is, it's a little overwhelming. Um, I totally agree. But there's also something to be said about how much free content there is being made. Like YouTube changed, also helped change the game. Because people are just making what they want and they have so much freedom to to be or or make what they want. And I think um, like we were talking about with like corporations kind of hopping on the bandwagon. I mean, you go to the trending page. It's not YouTubers anymore. You see you see Jimmy Fallon, you see Jimmy Kimmel, you see all these late night, uh, you know, clips that are being uploaded. And, you know, that's, you know, obviously bringing them tons more money. Um but when it comes to small screen versus big screen, uh, I don't think I don't think TV is dying. I just think less people are watching now more than less people are watching now because there's streaming, because there's the Internet, because, you know, it's so easy to find and watch content that you want in a separate way. I don't think uh, I don't think cable is is dead. I think it's still is uh you know it's still huge um but when it comes to movies it does feel like they're dying a little bit because of the past year i mean i try and go as much as i can uh i think you and i both are are uh, physical physical media people like you know books and and having dvds and or blu-ray or Depends you know the day is what i'll say yeah yeah, I mean, I've picked up a few things on like Criterion Collection or Blu-ray that I felt, you know, very strongly about. Um, so I have like a little bit of, you know, uh, some some movie collection. Uh, you know, I, I one of my um, my friend's dad gave me his old VHS collection. We have that, you know, downstairs. So uh, I'm still I'm still pretty big um, physical physical media person. I mean, there's nothing like sitting down. And and reading, uh, you know, a book or having the physical case, um, it just it feels a little more um, authentic, I guess that's the word to say, or, you know, it's a little more personal. Right. Um, I mean, because that's the whole yeah. I mean, you and I, you, again, we, we both remember watching those videos back in film school about the differences mm-hmm. and the people who support uh, digital versus um, f- uh, digital versus physical media and like the biggest yeah. arguments against digital uh, digital media in, g- in general. And Quentin Tarantino has been talking about this for mm-hmm. a long, long time, long before streaming was a thing is just the overall quality of it. Right. The, the uh, mm-hmm. he says it himself. It's like it makes the it makes the 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 
what what's called it makes the format feel more disposable, and mm-hmm. and that's ultimately what you've been seeing with yeah. the breaking down of streaming is the increased disposability of media. Where just think about it, right? You think mm-hmm. about like back in the day when they only had reels of film, and if they fucked it up, that was it. You know, yeah. like just think about just the, how much value it places on, and all of a sudden, the yeah. massive amounts of thousands upon millions of dollars that are thrown into this industry, was- it makes sense. But now, mm-hmm. obviously, with how you know consumable and how easy it all is right and Mm -hmm. filmmakers have talked about this too they're like yeah of course what's the number Mm -hmm. one thing in order to decrease the value of something make more of it and make it as easily accessible as possible you know do you do you know um was house of gucci shot on uh film or was it if i'm not mistaken it was shot on film but i got it which makes sense because it's scott so he's like i want it on film obviously it's gonna be be on film in that sense obviously i mean i think it's much cheaper and much easier to do digital um but film just has a little bit more of again it's about authenticity the art form uh the color the color that picks up on film right and the the actual resolution is way different i mean it's not way different digital sensors have been you know they've been, they've been getting better they've been getting I mean, better been, like they're amazing like netflix's they're cameras amazing. are insane what they're able to do but they're, absolutely yeah. yeah um but like like just to give a perfect example though just as far as like you'll ne- in order to like kind of contribute to the film experience right like mm-hmm. every time now i see something where i can see the film grain on screen i don't know like it just adds like an extra level of like you know, a special feeling to that film. Like I remember when I was down at New York film festival back in October and I watched uh come on, come on and red rocket, both those films, I could mm-hmm. see the grain on every frame and it just, it looked yeah. beautiful. It felt like I was watching art, you know? And I'm like, wow, so this, this is where yeah. it comes from. This is what people are talking about when they say preserving, like that's another, film. that's another separate conversation. I yeah. also saw come on, come on. Oh yeah. We, we got to talk about that. Definitely. But um, I, I guess if I, if I can wrap up our conversation just about house of Gucci, just in general, yeah. my final thoughts on it. Mm-hmm. Um, So it's a film that in hindsight, I definitely didn't hate as much Mm. as I thought I was going to, but it's definitely not one of my favorites of the year. I guess as far as like me recommending this to people, if you want to see something that is just kind of baffling and semi entertaining in Mm -hmm. like a little bit of a farcical way, but without actually like kind of understanding like how it's being farcical or what it's attempting to satirize. If it's Mm -hmm. trying to be a satire, sure. I guess this is good. The narrative is compelling Mm -hmm. enough. The characters are interesting enough. I think that kind of the story is good, Mm -hmm. but ultimately the kind of lack of consistent tone, lack of real, like kind Mm -hmm. of, purpose and aim as far as what it's trying to accomplish and what it's trying to say within the story and overall Mm -hmm. just complete again as tom ford said attempting to just ham it up beyond recognition from the actors unfortunately Mm -hmm. this only gets a three and a half out of five stars from me what about you three and a half out of five stars you know yeah i think that's a i think that's a fair i think that's pretty fair i mean if it was out of 10 again i think it was just the maybe a seven seven and a half so yeah i guess a 3.5 out of five stars um i don't think i mean it didn't come off like an intentional satire in the way that Wolf of Wall Street was, which goes way over people's right. heads. I mean, there right. are tons of, you know, all these finance people and business business students that they look at Jordan Belfort and like, oh, I want to be right, as a role model. Right. And that he, goes back to the Spike Club thing, is, right? And he is not a role model. The people watching those movies and same people who say it. the good it's the same people who say that oh good fellas embellishes the mob and it's like yeah if you actually watch the movie you would understand that you it understand, doesn't yeah because scorsese grew up around that life and that right. and is not trying to glamorize it in any way but it has been glamorized right and you know going going back to house of gucci i mean i i'm a big satire fan it, to me it didn't feel like a satire so i'm again i'm gonna have to go with probably a 3.5 3.5 out of 5. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. So with that being said, people, uh, that was it for our review of House of Gucci. Let us know your thoughts yep. in the comments section below. Make sure you guys have an extra special Thanksgiving, even though by the time this episode goes up, Thanksgiving will be over. But make sure that, you know, you stay safe with your families on that day. Make sure you get something nice for your guys selves. Maybe some early Christmas present for the rest of your family on Black Friday. Remember to treat your retail workers with with, with respect because trust me they don't want to be there in those work establishments adam thank you so much for coming back on to host this with me thank this you was thank you for having me absolute blast to have you back on i'm definitely going to have you back on more so for the channel like i said i'm trying to i'm trying Sweet. to expand the the talking tv kind of ca- rotating cast of players now and i'm definitely mm-hmm. adding you to the roster where can the good people follow you on the interwebs uh you can follow me i mean i'm not huge on social uh but if you want uh follow me uh, at adam somer films with uh, underscores uh, on Instagram. 
Uh, you can follow me on uh, Instagram. Uh, if you look up Adam Somer, it should be uh, at M-R-A-R-S uh, 97. Um, and then there's a different, I, there's a, di there's two, I have two accounts. There's one that I made years ago as like a prank as like a, like a, a, a fake, a fake account is, it was, account, I love it. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I don't use that one. I use the other one more so. Um, yeah. So if you want to follow me there, um, you know, that's, that's where I'm at. So yeah. Th thank you. Of course, you can follow me at Movie Nerd Reviews on Facebook and Instagram as always. And of course, be sure to follow the Talking TV podcast social medias at Talking TV podcast on Facebook and Instagram. Like I said, we got four weeks left in the year, people. We've still got more content coming your way. We've got three episodes left in our Succession Recap Series. Episode 7 mm -hmm. is coming out this week. I've got a couple more top 10 lists for you guys. We've got a whole bunch of Marvel content planned for the end of the year for when Spider-Man comes out. Be sure to keep tuning in until the That's end of the good. year for more content. Be sure to also click the subscribe button, click the like button, click the bell next to it. That way you guys get notified every time we put up new content. For myself and Adam, as always, people, 12 seasons in a short film and watch more fucking movies. See you guys next time.